Today's video is the second film in a two-part series that shows the throwing and the trimming of this large angular lidded jar. If you missed the first part, I'll leave a link to it on screen now and in the description below. And just like in last week's video, I'll be including some drawn elements to hopefully help explain some of the steps and some of the more complex processes shown. This is the rough shape of the thrown form I made. It includes the lid and the body of the jar, and once these parts have turned perfectly leather hard, they can be trimmed, the pot refined, made lighter as the walls are thinned out and the lid is trimmed to fit so it slots in perfectly. As winter approaches, I find myself working more and more with a spotlight like this. As the sun is low, not much gets through the skylights, and I dislike using the humming strip lights that came with the studio, but this works for now. Whenever I make lidded forms, I always begin by trimming the underside of the lid, both to remove excess weight and perhaps more importantly, make it fit the jar perfectly. The lid is tap centered so it spins in the middle and then I really firmly press stoneware clay against it to keep this component pinned in place. Just like the jaws you might find on a lathe, I start by removing any undulation found in the top of the rim on the locating flange. This is the section that slots inside the jar. Typically I throw lids quickly and roughly with a bit more clay than necessary so they aren't perfect. And despite having to do a bit of tidying up in terms of eliminating any irregularities, what this extra material gives me is flexibility and an assurance that as the piece dries to leather hard, even if it does deform slightly, I'll still always be able to trim it and make it fit. And this often involves trimming away a millimetre or two of clay from the outside portion of the vertical locating flange. And I purposefully throw this section thicker than need be, basically just to account for a myriad of things that could potentially go wrong. I also remove a considerable amount of clay from the inside to make the lid lighter, as the style of my lids means there's actually quite a lot of clay left in them, especially in the portions that overhang the rim of the jar, which I also turn to have more of a slope. This way the overhang hides the join between the two components when they're put together. I can't overemphasize how important it is for a lid to fit well. If a lid sits in place but rattles around as it was made inaccurately, then there's both a really high chance it will fall off with use, and annoyingly, it's a sign of insufficient skill. Yet, with that said, my first lidded jars rattled. They were anything but perfect, and ultimately, just like learning to make any other shape, it takes practice, determination, and a lot of trial and error. You may have just seen how I place the jar's body onto the lid, and I do this periodically as I'm turning the underside of the lid just to make sure it fits. And once I'm happy that it does, I continue refining the lid, neatening up the shape and removing excess clay to make it lighter. With the underside of the lid finished, I can begin work on the body of the jar. It's stuck onto the wheel with slip, rubbed back and forth a bit and then tap centered. I then use the rounded corner of a plastic kidney to seal a small portion of the clay into the metal, holding it tight. I begin at the top, refining the rim and removing a slight wavering motion so that it's level. I can then begin thinning out the walls from top to bottom, gripping the tool firmly, and occasionally this does happen. My fault, usually, as I either didn't stick it down firmly enough or I used the turning tool too aggressively and it caught dragging the pot off center. Let's try again. I tuck my elbow into my torso to stabilize it, and I'm even using the thumb of my left hand to brace the turning tool's blade so that it slices through the clay without letting the spinning jar influence its movement. Now, I want this jar to have two very distinct changes in its shape. The first is this angle at the top where this straight section meets the angular body. I want the two planes to connect with a very sharp corner as if instead I let it curve very gradually into it, 
Once the pot had been covered in glaze and fired, there wouldn't be enough of a difference between these two planes, and they'd sort of just blend into one. This is because the glazes I use tend to go on quite thickly, and this forces me at this stage to make pots that are very angular and sharp, as otherwise the glaze can completely overwhelm them as it softens the form of the pot. As my aim is to make a pot with straight planes, I use tools with straight blades, as not only is it easier to turn a straight line, but I can use the straight piece of metal, like a guide, to see if the part of the pot I'm turning is actually flat. Typically speaking, when I remove mass from a pot, I use one of these very sharp tungsten carbide turning tools, but they don't leave the nicest surface, and often they can chatter, leaving a slightly uneven finish behind them. So once the majority of the weight has been removed, and the shape is roughly where I want it, I burnish over the surface with a straight metal scraper that's slightly flexible, and due to its length I can use it like a guide to make sure each plane is perfectly flat. I just inserted my left arm inside the pot to feel opposite the area I was turning. This way I can feel exactly how thick the walls are, as obviously I need to be careful. If they're left too thick, the pot will feel bottom heavy, and if I trim them to be too thin, the weight of all the clay above can actually cause the walls to buckle and bulge outwards slightly around the base, which, as I'm trying to create such exact angular forms, never looks good. With the walls almost finished, I can begin work on the outside of the lid, which, as I trim, I'll keep pinned down with a spinner, like so, just to prevent it from leaping up, which it'll probably want to do as I turn away the sides. Now, for this particular shape, I want to trim the sides of the lid so they slope inwards like this, with the bottom of the lid lining up with this section of the jar beneath. I'll also be trimming the top of my lid so that it has a very slightly concave surface. This way I create a hollow so that when I dip the lid in glaze and lift it out, I can sort of catch glaze in this. This way the glaze will melt and pull into a very thick layer, intensifying in colour and creating a very intricate, crackled surface. The whole pot is wobbling slightly at this stage, but I don't mind, and as soon as the wheel is stopped, these slight inconsistencies will be barely perceivable, as it's only when the pot is spinning around very quickly that they become apparent. And for anyone watching who's new to this, all the trimmings you see that are removed can very easily be recycled into clay that can be thrown with again, so nothing really goes to waste. Yet this isn't the case after the two components have been fired in the kiln, as at that point, chemically, the clay has changed into ceramic, which, unlike clay, can't be dissolved in water, and thus has to be recycled in another way. It's for this reason that if I'm not happy with a pot I've made after turning it, I'll always destroy it so it can be recycled, as if I were to fire it and then make that decision, there isn't much I can actually do in studio to reuse that material. With the side of the lid now finished, I can move on to turning the top, and as I want this to be a carved out, hollow, rounded section, you've guessed it. I'm going to be using tools with round edges. As I'm no longer using the spinner on top, I'm now applying downward pressure with the fingers of my left hand and the turning tool itself, as even though the lid slots into the jar really well, if the tool were to catch, there's a chance it could be pulled up and out of its restraints. The hollow doesn't need to be really deep. Two or three millimetres is absolutely enough. And I also have to be careful not to make this expansive clay too thin, as if it is, and I pile a whole ton of glaze above it, there's a high chance a crack could develop somewhere here. I use a curved metal kidney to remove most of the turning marks, and then I switch to a much more flexible kidney, which is also much smoother, and I burnish the top, giving it a nice shine and a smoother finish. The lid can then be taken off, and it's only then that I'll turn this indentation beneath it, for which I switch to a much smaller turning tool. I round the top so it doesn't have quite so many sharp edges that could be prone to chipping, and then I switch my focus to this part, which, when thrown, appears to be more rounded, like so, but when I turn it, I want to make this part more of a right angle, in order for the glazes to react more interestingly over it. This does, though, in part weaken this section of the pot. And if I were to do this before I trim the lid, then there's a chance that with all the pressure used to push the lid down as I trimmed its sides, this part of the gallery might not be strong enough to support it, and the inner ring could collapse, 
splitting off the outer walls and falling inside the jar, which has happened to me enough. Hence why I always do it this way around now, no matter the shape I'm making. And then check to make sure the lid fits nicely and then I can begin work on the base. To remove the jar from the wheel, I slide a metal skim underneath it. The wheel head can then be scraped clean. This way there's no debris that could stick itself into the lid of the jar when it's placed upside down. As when turning the base, I'll be using the tightly fitting lid like a chuck to fit the jar over. And it's the vertical locating flange that'll keep the jar locked in place. Once placed down, I tap center the lid until the lower tapering half spins on center. As always, it's then secured in place with three bits of clay. And just like when turning the lid, I use a spinner on top to push down through. The base is beveled, which just gives the illusion that the pot is floating slightly over whichever surface you place it on, conveying a sense of lightness. Then I can begin work on the actual base, flattening it and eventually carving away some material from the middle of this. As always, I begin with a tungsten carbide tool and then I switch to a steel tool, which is more blunt, but it leaves a much smoother, burnished surface. I felt like the base was quite thick on this pot, so to make it lighter, I began to excavate clay from within the foot itself. Hollowing out a central portion whilst being very careful not to go too deep, as it's easier than you think to pierce a hole in the bottom. By making a foot ring like this, the pot retains the original shape and proportion it was thrown with, whereas if you turned it to be entirely flat across the bottom, you can actually end up changing the entire shape of the pot quite a lot, and in this case the pot would be more short and squat, as I really need the height in the lower half to give the pot the elegance it has. I think this is the most difficult part of the process. It's really easy to knock the piece off center or for it to tip left or right off the lid, which means as I'm trimming, half my focus is actually on the turning itself, whilst the rest of my attention is on keeping the jar level and stable. And as I'm so close to finishing this piece, it would be such a pain to ruin it now. As I work, I check the thickness of the base by pushing down with my thumb. And if it feels very solid and doesn't move, then that likely means there's more material that can be removed. Whereas if I feel it bow inwards ever so slightly, I know it's absolutely time to stop turning. As if I were to trim this to be paper thin and then glaze the interior very thickly, the base could easily crack as the thick glaze shrinks at a different rate as compared to the clay and the tension created is often enough to split the stoneware. My maker's mark is impressed into the beveled section of the foot and that's the body complete. I then always double check the underside of the lid as certain parts of this, especially the outside of the flange, can be slightly damaged as the rim of the jar spins around in situ here. So it's given a very light trim and all the different planes are neatened up and edges burnished. The last section to double check is the sharp top of the lid, as this has previously been upturned on the metal, and again, it could be slightly damaged in places, so it's lightly tap centered. I then burnish the top to make sure it's completely unblemished. And with that, this lid ajar is finally finished. It's a very simple shape that relies a lot on the proportions being right. The lid can't be too thick or too thin, otherwise it becomes overbearing and heavy or inconsequential if it's too narrow. I want this pot to dry out slowly to bone dry before it's bisque fired to 1000 degrees Celsius. So I'll sling some plastic over it and let it sit quietly for a week or two with periodic checks to make sure the lid still fits. As if dried unevenly, there is a chance it could become stuck on top of the jar. There may be a third part to this video in the future that shows the glazing, the firing and the finished vessel. So please do let me know if you'd like to see that. And if you did make it this far into the video, thank you. I'm very lucky to have such a supportive audience here and I always love reading your comments. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.